Well, let's turn together in God's Word to Mark 9, and we'll look together at verses 38 through 41. Mark 9, verse 38 through 41, where God's Word reads as follows. John said to him, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him. For no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me. For the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. So far, the reading from God's word, may he add his blessing to our hearts. Well, this Past week on Tuesday, uh, our presbytery met in Savannah at Grace Church of the Islands. And as is our custom, every presbytery meeting begins with preaching, with singing, with prayer. And this past presbytery meeting, uh, Pastor Foster from Grace Church of the Islands preached to us, to the gathered elders from John 3, verse 25 and 30, which is that well-known passage that talks about how John must decrease, but Christ must uh, increase. And as he preached through that passage, we were challenged to consider the glory of Christ, to consider the kingdom of God instead of accumulating our own kingdom in each local uh, congregation. And that was a great reminder. Uh, for all the gathered elders regarding the church as God's possession, the church as Christ's kingdom, belonging to Him and and serving Him. Well, when you read this text, it seems like it would have been good for the Apostle John to be there to hear that sermon as well. He needs that reminder as well because what we have in our text is a picture of good old-fashioned Christian Tribalism, uh, tribalism, the, the elevation of your group within the larger group uh, for its own glory. So the elevation of John and his friends among the larger group of those who belong to Christ for the sake of preserving their own spot, for the sake of preserving their own station. And it was It was alive and kicking during the time of the apostles, and it is alive and well in the church today as well. And yet the text that we're considering together tonight doesn't excuse what we would call tribalism. It doesn't excuse cliquishness or or segregation along different lines in the church of God. No, the text before us today gives us a a very different picture where Jesus teaches us that the people of God are united in their worship and service of God. The people of God are united in their worship and service of God. And to learn that lesson, we're going to look at this text by first considering the problem as John sees it in verse 38, and then we're going to see the correction as Christ gives it in verse 39 to 41. So the problem as John sees it, the correction as Christ gives it. So first, let's con- consider together what John sees to be the problem here in this text. Uh, I want to say at first, this is a good day to consider the feet of clay that belong to all of the disciples. Uh, very often we would say the Apostle Peter He's the guy who makes who trips up. He's the one who makes the big blunders. He's the, he's the one who, who's so impetuous, so impulsive. And oftentimes it's easy to so, see how the Apostle Peter goes astray. And so we can tend to make much of Peter's failings. But here you see that the Apostle John really isn't doing any better. The Apostle John isn't doing any better than Peter. John has his own problem. John's desire is for power, for control, for respect. This is not the first time 
that we've seen John bumping into this sin in his life. Back in verse 34, he was one of the twelve who had argued on the way to Capernaum which one of them was the most important of the twelve. Or you could uh, flip over uh, just a little bit past where we are in, in chapter 10 where James and John come to Christ and they ask Christ that they could sit on the right and left hand of Him when He comes in His glory. In other words, they're asking for this position of great importance, each of them, to be the closest ones to Christ. So John has an elevated sense of his own importance. And here in this text, it shows that he has an elevated sense of importance of his own tribe, of his own group. John in this text seems to come to Christ in a spirit of self-congratulation. Some commentators want to make it sound like, like John is perturbed in spirit and that he's coming in some sense to confess his sins to Christ doesn't read that way at all as far as I'm concerned. It seems like John is saying, yeah, but Christ has just told them that they're to forsake themselves, that they're to think nothing of themselves. And then John comes in and paints this picture of a proper exclusion of a person because they don't belong to his group. Now today, we would call what John did, we would call that being tone deaf. Having just heard a lesson, John completely ignores it and continues down that same sinful path, this sinful path of elevating self at the expense of of another. Jesus had just told him to stop thinking about his own greatness, and the next thing you hear from John is, Teacher, we saw somebody casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he wasn't following us. So whatever John was thinking when he said that, what you can see is that John is placing himself squarely in the midst of the decision-making body. You recognize he, he's telling Jesus that he told this man to stop because he wasn't one of us. First person, plural. He, he is saying This man is not part of my tribe, and so he should be quiet. See, John has immediately returned to his own greatness, immediately begun to focus on himself. And yet what we see here is even though we're used to Peter being the spokesman and and speaking on behalf of the apostles here, it seems like John is being the spokesman. Because his statement shows that he's not alone. He's not the only. It's not that that John doesn't say, I told him to stop. No, John says in verse 38 that we tried to stop him. It's a first person plural. It was a sentiment of the disciples as a whole. And we know that because we can trace back what the antecedent is of this word we. The antecedent, so we is a pronoun. A little grammar lesson. We is a pronoun. We points to something. It points to a proper noun. Well, that proper noun that it's pointing to is called the antecedent. And and this antecedent can be found in our text. When John says that we saw someone and that we tried to stop him, he is actually representing the twelve. John is the spokesman who presents the problem. There is a man outside their group who is casting out demons and we try to stop him. Now, who is the we? Well, Jesus has just been talking to the disciples as a whole. And in verse 35, you see that Jesus sat down and called the twelve. So Jesus, this is still a continuation of that same conversation. Jesus gathers the twelve. And at the end of that conversation, John says, we. Well, that that we is the twelve. The ones that Jesus has, has gathered. John is the spokesman and presents the problem that they all saw. Now, here's the difficulty. It's not, it's not always wrong to confront somebody who is outside of your group. 
It just depends what your group is and how you're making the determination. Those who are outside of Christ, for example, those who deny being his disciples should be excluded from using his name and confronted when they use his name blasphemously, when they take his name in vain. So, so think about this. When a Muslim speaks of Jesus as the great prophet, or as a great prophet, or if the Jehovah's Witnesses refer to Jesus as a God, or when the Mormons say that they're the church of the latter day, the church of Jesus Christ of the latter day saints, the church should not remain silent about that. The church should not just say, yeah, I guess we're all the same thing, because we're not. There is a a fundamental difference in the system of doctrine, even as it touches on the way of salvation. But John isn't talking about those who are outside of Christ. John is talking about those who are outside of his group. John is talking about those who are outside of the us, the twelve. John isn't even asking the question if this man follows Christ. He's just recognizing that this man isn't part of of their group. And that is the territorialism of the twelve. It's not only the territorialism of the twelve. That territorialism is seen in other places as well. You see it also in the disciples of John the Baptist in chapter 3 and verse 26 when the disciples of John come to him with their complaint. They're talking about Christ and they say, look, he's baptizing and all are going to him. As if it's a problem that people would go to Christ instead of John the Baptist. And so those disciples and the Apostle John's assessment of a person isn't made with relation to Christ. It's made in relation to their own group. And in the church today, (coughs) lines are drawn that way in various ways. Uh, Sometimes we draw them denominationally, where Presbyterians distrust the Baptists and the Baptists distrust the Presbyterians, and nobody trusts the non-denominationals. Or you draw those lines doctrinally. You know, your your eschatology, your view of the end times isn't like mine, and that makes me view you with a suspicious eye. Or we could think about things like church government, and we would say our church government is different, and so you are not to be trusted. You are outside of my group, and so therefore... Can I even consider you as being part of Christ? Well, what does Christ say? How does Christ bring correction uh, to John and his assessment of things? Well, in verses uh, 39 and following, notice uh, what Jesus does. Jesus disapproves of what John reports. Jesus disapproves of what the twelve have tried to do. Jesus said, do not stop him. Do not stop him. Why does Jesus say, do not stop him? Well, Jesus gives two reasons. First, the one who does a mighty work in Jesus' name cannot speak evil of him. And secondly, the one who is not against Christ or his people is for them. Now, why would he say that somebody who does a miracle, a powerful work in Jesus' name, cannot speak evil of him? Well, the text does give to us some, some qualifiers, some ways that we can, we can understand what Jesus is getting at. The person who is stopped by the disciples is in a specific category, and even in John's report, he acknowledges it. So if you look at John's report in verse 38, you see this person casting out demons, and how is he doing it? He's casting out demons... In your name, John says. So he's, he is laboring using the name of Christ to cast out demons. So whoever this man is, he, he is unnamed in our text. He is ministering in the name of Christ and he is experiencing some level of success in what he's doing. Now that's an important distinguishing qualifier and description. 
because casting out demons in Scripture is not a formulaic thing. It's not just that anybody who uses Jesus' name is successful in casting out demons in Scripture. Citing Jesus' name is never enough to simply command demons. The seven sons of Sceva undertook that kind of strategy. In Acts 19, they were seven sons of one of the high priests, and it says that they were itinerant exorcists. So people who went around the countryside ostensibly casting out demons. I think there's a a reason why they were itinerant, probably. They had to move from place to place as people saw the fraud of their ministry. But they latched on to this notion that Jesus' name was effective in casting out demons. And it says that these men, these seven sons, undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits. That's what it says in in Acts 19 and verse 13. And, And if you have read through the book of Acts recently, you remember how that works out for them. They invoke Christ's name to cast out demons. And in verse 14, it says, the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And what happened next? The, the, the demon-possessed man overpowers all seven of them, beats them, and they run out of the house naked. So simply invoking Jesus' name isn't sufficient to have an effective impact on a demon. The fact that this man is successful in some way indicates that he is a true follower of Christ, even though he's not one of the twelve. Now, are there such people in the New Testament? People who are not one of the, the, the disciples of Christ, not one of the people who followed Christ around from place to place. There are people like that. Take, for example, the man who Christ healed of the legion of demons in the garrison. He begged Christ that he could go with him. And what did Christ say to him? No. He sent him home. He sent him away from this group. But uh, nevertheless, this man had a living and abiding faith that, that caused him to beg that he could be with Christ. So whoever this person is, he is doing mighty works in the name of Christ. And he is successful because he is a follower of Christ. He is saved by faith in Christ. Now, the person who does mighty works in that way, in the name of Christ, isn't able to speak evil of Christ because he loves Christ, because he follows Christ. And that's the normal way, except for in highly unusual circumstances, people are not given the ability to do powerful deeds void of faith in Christ. So such a man may not be known to the twelve, but he is known to Christ. He is known to his Savior. So he may not belong to their group, but he is is known by the king of that group. Maybe they don't understand his connection to Christ, but Christ in the fullness of time has already ordained that he would bleed and die for this man. And so that's why Jesus says that a person who does this kind of thing can't speak evil of him because he belongs to him. And in the second place, it says that they shouldn't stop him because the one who isn't against us is for us, he says in, in verse 40. Now, that's the same, not the same thing as saying that there is some kind of neutral position regarding Christ. And so long as you don't oppose him, that therefore you are counted as one who is for him. We know that to be true because Matthew 12 and verse 30 says the opposite. In Matthew 12 and verse 30, it says, whoever is not with me is against me. And so it can't be that there's this neutral ground. Jesus doesn't have to say everything he possibly could say in every sentence that is written in the Gospels. But what is Jesus doing? Jesus is addressing the underlying sense of animosity from John. John thinks, because they're not part of my group, therefore they must be against Christ. And Jesus is saying to him, this man is not against Christ. He's not against him. He is for him. So Jesus disapproves 
of his disciples trying to get them to stop, this man to stop, for those two reasons. Because this man won't speak evil of Christ because he belongs to Christ. And because he's not their enemy. He's not opposed to them. He's not against them. He is for Christ. He is for he's he is a fellow follower of Christ. And in doing that, Jesus really sets two things before us. Jesus first shows us, he, he first teaches that the gifts of faith belong to the faithful. What does that mean? That means that there is evidence in this man that the Holy Spirit indwells him through the workings and the gifts of his faith. Uh, what has Jesus said in other places? John 14 and verse 12, Jesus says, I, say, I truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. What is this man doing? Jesus is doing, or this man is doing the works that Jesus does. He is a man who believes in him. Earlier on in, in the book of Mark, we saw how Satan does not cast out Satan. How an evildoer will not cast out demons because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And in fact, in Mark 3 and verse 27, it describes how the only reason demons are cast out is because they are overpowered and bound by Christ. Christ has bound the strong man. Christ has bound Satan, and so now the demon can be cast out. See, John has, has gone wrong in his thinking by separating union to Christ from union with his tribe. In other words, John has thought that the only way you can be joined to Christ is if you belong to his group. That is the error that Paul that that uh, John makes. Now, the casting out of demons and talking about it, it's not usually in our comfort zone. As, as modern Christians, it makes us uncomfortable. And the point of this text isn't to figure out whether or not casting out demons is still possible today. In my personal view, which is of very little significance, is that I think it does still happen not with the same frequency and not in the same way as during the lives of the, the apostles. But that's really not the question that this text is asking. This text is asking a, a very different kind of question. It's, it's not a question about gifts and demons. It's a question about how do you recognize who belongs to Christ? And John has mislabeled this man. John has said this man doesn't belong to Christ because he doesn't belong to my group. And Jesus corrects him at that point. He corrects the twelve as a whole. This man is doing the works that Christ does. He is demonstrating the gifts of faith which belong to the faithful. This man's activity actually proves that he does belong to Christ. And it is not as John thinks it is. This man is not against Christ. He is for Christ, and he should be welcomed as belonging to Christ in the fellowship of the saints. And then Jesus teaches an additional point that, that is related to that. So Jesus is teaching that the gifts of faith belong to the faithful. And then on top of that, he, he makes an additional point that, that removes this attempt to make distinctions based on associations, because Christ also shows that the works of faith belong to the faithful. Not only can you see who belongs to Christ by the gifts, but also how they exercise their gifts. So the one who loves God's people belongs to God's people. That's the point that Jesus makes in verse 40, 41. Truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink, why? Because you belong to Christ, so whoever serves the body of Christ will by no means lose his reward, it says. Love shown to the people of God is love shown to Christ and to the Father as a result. Now Jesus makes a very similar statement in Matthew's Gospels. To me, it's not entirely clear if it's 
exactly the same event, but it's a similar kind of event. And the context kind of helps clarify, the context in Matthew's Gospel helps clarify what we're dealing with here in Mark's Gospel. And in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is more explicit. When describing the same kind of conversation, Jesus says to his disciples, whoever receives you receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent, you, who sent me. So belonging to Christ isn't seen by some kind of association to a subgroup within the larger group. But it is seen by the evidences of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the evidences of affection for God's people, and the using of the works of faith which belong to the faithful. Christians live in relationship with others who belong to Christ, and because Christ loves them, they love each other. That is the, the communion that we have with each other in the Lord's Supper. Yes, we have communion with God by partaking of bread and wine by faith, but we also have communion with each other where, where we declare we share this common Lord, this common Lord, and, and for whom is the table open? Is the table open for this limited body? Or is it open to all who call on the name of Christ with, with a verifiable profession of faith, members of a church and so on? The table belongs to all God's people. So not only should we have communion with each other, we have communion more broadly speaking with the broader church of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that means that from this text we should consider that the body of Christ extends beyond our immediate circles. Now, of course, there are puzzling questions that arise when we come to these, these difficult questions that we have to wrestle with. So if you think about uh, the Roman Catholic Church who proclaims a different gospel, but are there Christians in the Roman Catholic Church? What do you do when a church adopts positions that are against the Word of God? Can a church which faithfully preaches the gospel as it is recorded in God's Word but has women as ministers, can they be properly considered our brothers and sisters in Christ? Well, we don't reach conclusions via difficult cases, and it's not my intention to solve those difficult cases today. In the main, what has Christ said in this text? Christ has told us to recognize His followers based on their gifts, and based on their works. In other words, we're to ask the question, do they have the gifts of the faithful, and are these gifts complemented by the works of the faithful? Well, there's another place that really helps us work through that in a twofold way, and that's in, in the book of Romans. Romans 12 and verse 6 through 13, there's this clear delineation between the gifts of the church, and the living of the church. So what are the gifts of the faithful? What are the gifts that we should be looking at in order to be able to see the disciples of Christ? Well, in Scripture there are, of course, the controversial gifts, the, the speaking in tongues, the prophetic utterances, and, and so on. These extraordinary gifts, we would call them extraordinary gifts, which have ceased with the time of the apostles. But there are many different examples of ordinary gifts in Scripture as well. In Romans 12 and verse 6 through 8, it, it mentions many of them. It talks of, of prophecy, meaning the declaration of God's Word, which though it doesn't happen in, in, in New Revelation today, there is the prophetic declaration of His Word in the preaching of sermons. There is the gift of service, those who labor at caring for the church of Christ and those within her membership. You have the gifts of teaching, those who 
shared their gifts in increasing the knowledge of what God has said in His Word so that others would benefit from it. There is also the gift of exhortation in, in Romans 12 and, and verse 8 in, in calling people, the people of God, to faithfulness. You see in verse 8 also contribution as one of the gifts that belongs to the Christian giving generously that the true preaching of the gospel may continue. You have leadership when it describes the one who leads, meaning the shepherding function of the elders as, as they refute error, as they promote the truth, as they use the keys of the kingdom to open it to the repentant and shut it to the obstinate. And then lastly, in verse 8, it talks about the one who does acts of mercy, the work of the deacons in caring for the poor, the widow and, and the orphan. And to these gifts are added also descriptions in verse 9 and following of how those gifts are worked out in the life of the church. Uh, these gifts will be combined with works that will be recognizable as belonging to God's people. So first it talks about genuine love. Genuine love as, as part of the work of a Christian. One of the marks of somebody who belongs to Christ. Genuine love meaning not just building a community around shared ideas. Genuine love is, a, is derived from God's love for His people and seeks the good and seeks to nurture and care for the individual beyond propositions. It's not just about building a group identity. It's about caring for each other within this group for the service and glory of God. In verse 9, it also says that the Christian will abhor what is evil. The Christian will hate what is evil? There is no affirmation of anything that God might condemn in His church. A church that affirms sin is not a church. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that a church can't make a mistake on what God says. That's not what I'm saying. But a church that says, I know what God said here. I know that God said no, but I say yes. That's what I'm talking about. A church who doesn't hate evil in that way. A church that, that denies God's word, that says yes when God says no. That is a church that has the sure sign of apostasy on it. It says also that the Christian should hold fast to what is good. So it's not enough just to be against the things that are evil. We are to be for the things that are good. There must be a proactive pursuit of the truth. Now, of course, Christians can come to different understandings of what the truth, what 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 the truth is from a study of Scripture but we can't come to different conclusions about what is good because God has defined for us the things that are good. There are the things according to His Word. You see many things that are good in the law of God, in the wisdom of God, in the book of Proverbs, and, and so on. And we as Christians are to hold fast to the things that are good. So a Christian should be seen even if they come to different conclusions than you, they should be seen as pouring over the Word of God, deriving their marching orders from that Word. It also says that they are to outdo each other in showing honor in Romans 12 and verse 10. There's to be an eagerness in the church to show honor. That's the opposite of eagerness to receive honor. That's John's 
problem here in our text. He is eager to receive honor. Christians are e- should be eager to show honor. Also says that the Christian is to be fervent in spirit. There's not to be an apathetic spirit to the people of God. Now, what are some ways that the people of God can manifest an apathetic spirit? Well, it's troubling at times to see the decrease of the number of worship services in our nation. There is a lack of fervency of spirit in that regard. It is a a sign of spiritual unhealth in a person if they are quick to make excuses to absent themselves from the worship of God when it is available to them. So that could be a manifestation of a lack of fervency of spirit. But it can also show up in other ways. It should be a, a huge red flag to any Christian if a church stresses correct doctrine but lacks any fervency about their relationship with God and Christ. The pursuit of doctrine simply becomes an an academic exercise, void of faith, void of a consideration of Christ and His work on the cross for them. That can also be a manifestation of a lack of fervency of spirit. It says in verse 12 of Romans 12 that the Christian is to rejoice in hope. They're to be joyful, in other words. Joyfulness is not to be confused with happiness. Our happiness is is very fickle. Uh, We can be happy one minute and and some circumstance changes and we can become discouraged and, and so on. But joy is constant. Joy doesn't change. The the church should have a joyful spirit because it rests on the promises of salvation. Every Christian has that in common. There's resting on the promises of salvation in Jesus Christ. The the man who was casting out demons and John, well, they have the same hope, don't they? They have the same foundation for any sense of joy that they might have. So the Christian church is not a place for anxious hand-wringing and shoulder-checking, a place of being reactionary. It is a place of joyful worship of the God who saves. And that would be true in any church that rightly understands the gospel. It also says that we are not only to be rejoicing in hope, but that we are to be patient in tribulation. The church endures the hardships of this world in the anticipation of future glory. The church doesn't flee tribulation at all costs. The church doesn't collapse to be comfortable. I'm not saying that churches never have done that and that there's no no path back from that. But I'm saying that a faithful church will be patient in tribulation, it will bear up under the hardships that God in His wisdom brings to bear on them. Also says in Romans 12.12 12, that the Christian will be constant in prayer. In times of ease, the Christian will rejoice in what God provides. In times of need, they will cry out to God for deliverance but they will always recognize that He is the one who supplies. And they do that by prayer. Prayer is that ultimate acknowledgement of your dependence on God. In verse 13 of Romans 12, it says that the Christian will contribute to the needs of the saints. So they are not so heavenly minded as to be no earthly good. And I, I don't really like that turn a phrase that much because ultimately we are heavenly minded as a motivation but we are heavenly minded so that we can do as much earthly good as we can working out our salvation in fear and trembling here in this world and then lastly it says that the Christian will seek to show hospitality 
The church is not a body in isolation. The church is made up of people who are generous and willing to share because Christ has suffered and bled and died for them. They are willing to share in time and treasure with those other people, other souls who have professed that Christ has suffered and bled and died for them as well. The body of Christ seeks fellowship. The body of Christ desires fellowship. The body of Christ desires to know each other, to encourage each other towards love and good works. Now you notice what's missing in all of Romans 12 as we've thought about the gifts and the outworking of those gifts in the works of the Christian. There's no mention anywhere the question of whether or not they are part of your group, whether they are part of your denomination. The question is never in Scripture whether they belong to you. The question is always whether they belong to Christ. Do they profess His name? Do they have gifts that are clearly derived from the working of the Holy Spirit? Is the fruit of their lives consistent with the fruit of those He awakens by His Spirit? See here, the Lord Jesus Christ condemns prideful division. He condemns the setting up of self as as the standard of what is good. So today, as as we prayed for our Reformed Baptist brothers and sisters in, in Chattanooga, can you rejoice that a faithful church, whatever denomination they may be, is thriving under the preaching of the gospel? Can, can you rejoice that they are blessed with greater tangible success than you are? Can you rejoice in the work of God in His kingdom? I hope so. Whatever millennialism you fall, follow, can you rejoice in the spiritual growth of someone who gets the end times all wrong, even if they're pre-millennial, can you still rejoice in their spiritual growth? Can any good thing come out of Anglicanism? The message of Scripture says that's asking all the wrong questions. The question that we're to ask doesn't have to do with a human affiliation within reason. It has to do primarily with whether or not they are joined to Christ. It has to do with whether or not His blood was shed for their salvation to take on themselves, to take on Him the guilt of their sin. Now, what am I saying? The message of Scripture is not that things like sacraments and church government and eschatology and uh, other things, that those, those theological issues don't matter. That's not the, the teaching of Scripture at all. But Scripture does point us away from ourselves and from our group. The Scripture does point us to Christ and to consider a person's union to Him. As the, as the deciding factor as to whether or not he or she is a brother or a sister. It doesn't have to do with Presbyterianism or non-denominationalism or being a Baptist or an Anglican or any other brand of, of Christian. The question is, if Christ is received by faith, And there will be those who Christ receives by faith who you think will be in error. And they will probably think that you are in error. And they might even remain in that error. But brothers and sisters, we cannot cast out the one for who Christ died. We cannot do it. 
So John presents Jesus with something the 12 see as a problem. This, this man is not in their group and he is encroaching on their importance, encroaching on their status. And Christ in that conversation corrects them. Just because the man isn't in their group doesn't mean he is not God's child by faith. This man is not against Christ as John imagines, but he is for Christ because he does these marvelous works in his name. John is, is looking at all the wrong places. He's failing to recognize spiritual gifts and the exercise of those gifts in, in bearing fruit. And so we too must be on our guard against pride in the church as well because we must be on guard against pride in the church just because somebody may not be in our group, in our denomination, do things the way that we would like them to do. The question is not, are they in the PCA? Are they Presbyterian? The question is, do they belong to Christ? Let's pray together.